Doug are going to teach a class today on, on basically the local advice that works here. What, what season? So right now you're being tempted, you were tempted last week to plant everything. And you know why we're holding you back going, oh, it's not going to stay like this. It's going to be frosty again, and it will be frosty again. So it doesn't, the long range forecast says, beautiful weather. I'm telling you, we'll have another frost before the end of, end of April. Good morning, everybody. Thanks for coming today. Uh, I thought we would start out with just uh, kind of an overview of uh, the climate here, the soil, and so on. And I'm curious as to how many folks here have been gardening, say, for a year or two? Here, yeah, here is what I mean. So just a few, not too many. Uh, we always like to incorporate information uh, about the local gardening conditions here so that you know. So if you don't mind, you may have heard this before, but I think it's important to know that there are multiple factors that affect gardening here. And uh, so these include the altitude, obviously, the big difference uh, temperature-wise between daytime and nighttime, the extremely low humidity, the very uh, strong hot sunshine in the summertime, the southwest prevailing winds, which we had a taste of yesterday and they won't go away for a while, I'm sure. And then probably one of the most important uh, has to do with the soils here. So if we actually have soils in our yards, some of us are lucky and do, um, that's good. But whatever you have, and some people say, okay, we've got clay, we have caliche, I have rocks for the soil in my yard, or I have just crummy dirt, or I have the, um, the when I dig in the ground, what's left is what the contractor left for me. You know, they decided to bulldoze and bury the trash because they didn't feel like hauling it all the way. Okay, so that makes it difficult. I used to receive wonderful packages of irises from my sister-in-law, and then I think, this is really nice, now where am I going to plant them? You know, where there's a good spot, and there's some water, and, and maybe there's a boulder there. That would leave, leave me with very few options, because I'd go out to what I thought might be a good spot and just hit rock. Uh, we have a planting crew, by the way, folks who go out and they deliver plants and trees, you know what one of the tools they have in their yard is the jackhammer. It's there all the time, along with the shovels and the rakes. So, so the moral of the story is then, whatever type of soil you think you have, um, and you can benefit from uh, amending the soil. Organic material, you can never put too much organic material into the soil. And it's something that you think, okay, I'm going to work this area here. It's a nice bed. I'm going to put flowers in. I'm going to put some mulch compost, that's great. But you know, it doesn't last forever, and so it needs to be replenished. And you can take, for example, our um, premium mulch here, you can actually sprinkle that and use it as mulch. After, you say, you've amended the soil the next season, you decide, okay, um, the ground has maybe even dropped a bit because the organic material has decomposed. It's doing what it's supposed to do. You can always add some on top as top dressing. So then, um, so Ken talked about, uh, we talked about we mentioned temperatures, uh, and everything we have in here, with the exception of flowers and vegetables up here, uh, will be cold hardy. Everything, almost everything we have down below, trees, shrubs, flowers, uh, they will go down to uh, zero, maybe even minus 10. So you don't have to worry about cold hardiness with the plants that we select when you bring them in here. There are some exceptions, like this bougainvillea is beautiful, but it's not going to survive the winter here. In spite of, I have a neighbor who has beautiful bougainvillea in her front yard, and in the wintertime she covers it up with a pillowcase. Now, to me, that's not very attractive for six months out of the year to look at a pillowcase. But some people bring them indoors, some people take them to their house in Phoenix, or if you really love them, you should go live in India or you know, Palm Springs because you can't walk 10 feet without seeing them down there. There are so many of them. Um, but temperature, back to temperature now. Ken mentioned that we have tomatoes here. When people buy them, be cautious about it. Be careful because you really shouldn't plant these till maybe Mother's Day. It seems to me Mother's Day is early this year. Um, you can put vegetables in the ground, but if it isn't 50 degrees at, overnight, 
on a regular basis, they're probably not going to do very well. They're just going to sit there in neutral and kind of struggle and not do very much. So you have to be careful. That's one of the ways to kind of adjust. I mean, we can have frost as late as uh, the end, near the end of May, and that's happened. And then we can have a frost can come back again in October, which that isn't so bad. We have we still have over on this side the cool season vegetables that you can grow, you know, the kale, the char, the lettuce, and spinach. That's one of the nice things about the climate that we have here. We do have four seasons. So you can have your summer vegetables once it gets warmer, as we mentioned. But then when it gets cooler, you can also have lettuce and char. I had some bok choy that was doing really well. In fact, uh, it's doing so well, the birds loved it and they got to it before I could, but um, they, didn't, they didn't bother the lettuce too much, so I had some pretty nice uh, romaine lettuce growing in the yard. And it really, uh, it really did well until just about the first snow that we got, which was kind of late in the season. So, um, so you have to be aware, um, you know, we're at Zone 6B, that's a U.S. Department of Agriculture Zone 6B, and when you look at the tags on most of the plants, they'll, they'll say, okay, zones four to six, something like that. Um, so the, uh, the lower the number, that means the lower the temperature is going to be. But in general, for the area here, 6B to 7 is pretty much where we are. And that means that, that the cold temperature that we get in the wintertime will be okay for our plants. And in fact, over here, where we, we've got fruit trees over on this side, they actually, like that cold weather. They need a certain number of hours. It's called chill factor. If they're going to produce well next spring, they're going to need uh, for anywhere from 400 to 700 hours of chill factor, which means they want a temperature that's somewhere between 32 and 45, somewhere in that range. So when you look at 400 hours, maybe that seems like a lot, but uh, you know, a lot of it's cold a lot of nights, and um, that's that's one of the advantages of having living in the mountains where there's a cool climate. Vegetable fruit trees can do really well because the apples, cherries, peaches, plums, all those fruits that we carry, they like that cold weather. And the more uh, chill hours, the later it blooms. So when you're looking for uh, your fruit trees, you want the higher chill numbers. Um, the ones that are lower, which unfortunately are your peaches and your apricots and nectarines, they are um, usually in that 400 range, whereas your apples, if some of the other ones are more, they have eight, seven and 800 chill hours, so they don't bloom quite as early. And the reason that that's important is that you can get an early bloom, you know, we'll get some nice mild weather in February or March, all of a sudden your fruit trees are blossoming and you're all excited, and then guess what? We get a hailstorm, or we get a really cold snap, and uh, the tree is going to be okay, but chances are you won't have any fruit that season, which is kind of disappointing uh, for people who are you know, passionate about having fruit. My next door neighbor, um, well last summer, I have to tell you that, so many people told us that this was really the best year that fruit tree had ever had. In fact, some people came in and said, I didn't even know I had a fruit tree <laughs> until this came out. What are they, and are they edible? And I said, yeah, those look like cherries to me. Still didn't believe me that it was edible, so I said, here, I'll just take a bite out of you, what a cherry looks like. So I took a bite out of it, it wasn't too bad, it wasn't quite right, but it's all, all about you know the right conditions, the right amount of moisture and temperature. And last year was a good year. In fact, it was such a good year that some of the flowering non-fruiting trees even had fruit, which happens every now and then, it's not a regular thing. So people were quite puzzled saying, but I bought this fruitless cherry tree, and now I have cherries, what's going on? Well, <laughs> chances are, you know, it was, uh, most trees are grafted, and so the, the rootstock was probably a fruiting tree, and then the, you know, what was grafted on there was non-fruiting, but that probably won't happen again this year. And who knows what the weather's going to be like as far as fruit trees, I know that, I was out working in my vegetable garden and my neighbor asked me to come over and help her pick her cherry tree and she had clumps of cherries that looked like big grape clumps, you know, just pull them and put them in bags and the, the birds had pecked away and eaten some of them and so, you know, that's part of life here too is as long as there's, there's sort of a balance where maybe the birds can get some of the cherries but you get most of them and everybody's happy. Um, so anyway, 
we talked to. Okay, so the temperature, the soil, seasons, we all know about the seasons. Um, one of the nice things about the cool season, as well as the vegetables we mentioned, is, for example, you can grow pansies. We've had pansies here all winter long, and they do really well. They'll, they'll survive snowstorm, hail, cold weather. Um, they, they really like it. They're really anything but pansies. They're quite hardy plants. And you don't have to worry about them uh, or worry about replacing them until maybe June or July when it gets really hot. And that's what happened to mine last year. I, they just hung in there, they did well. Finally, we have so many new summer flowers here that I just replaced them. Uh, took them out and put some summer plants. And so um, you don't have to be totally barren all winter long. You can grow pansies and do them again next year. Just a word to the wise. If you want pansies, now's the time to get them because their availability is getting very, very slim. So if you want them, now's the time. And this will be good till June or July. There, we have some people who come in and say when it gets warm, they move their pansies uh, over in a shady, cooler spot and they do better and they maybe even last through the summer. Uh, that's something that you can consider if you feel like doing that. So another one of the challenges challenges we face here uh, are the pests and we'll talk first of all about the, the animals and many many people are in here saying I want you know I want a plant that will not be eaten by javelina deer rabbit gophers squirrels I just okay we've got these lists and these are good for javelina these are good for deer whatever it might be it's a challenge one thing you can consider is you can get Javelina it's proof. proof. <laughs> this, this is guaranteed to be animal proof. And one thing I thought about though is that Javelina could stumble over this and maybe damage it, but they're not going to. They're not going to eat it. And see, so many many people uh, who live here live near uh, maybe in the near the national forest, and they don't know it. Maybe when they move into the house, that, that their backyard could be a trail that these animals have been using since time began, and they're going to come through and they're going to help themselves, they're hungry as well. So there are, uh, there are a number of strategies, some are more successful than others, but when people ask for plants that the animals are not going to eat, the first thing that I always tell them is think about herbal plants. Think about, this is autumn sage right here. So think about sage, think about uh, rosemary, lavender, because it's very likely that they're just not going to want to eat this. this. These herbal plants, the taste and the smell are just way too strong for them. So while they love roses and they love nice juicy flowers and they seem to love everything that's in your yard, uh, they're probably not going to love these. And so those are always good choices. And the plants that we mentioned, we've got plenty of a selection of those. They're all going to be, they're going to do well and they're going to be animal free. Now, Another common pest, of course, is uh, gophers. I had gophers ate an entire potato crop that I had. They, they picked them just about the day I was ready to pick them. They, they always know first that whatever it is, it is is ready, and they usually get to it before you can. Ken has an entire class on gophers and underground pests because they can be a challenge. So if you, um, you can always watch um, this class, and I'm sure you want to, to refresh your memory and just, you know, enjoy the values and everything. But you can look at Ken's class on gophers, for example, because they're all on YouTube videos. And you should be prepared because Ken's approach is no tolerance. This is not, we're not talking about catch and release here, you know. <laughs> his, his approach, and I, and I agree with this, is, if, you know, they, those animals are going to come into my yard at their risk. This is my space. I want these flowers, vegetables, whatever it might be, because I work hard on them, and it's just no tolerance. So we have everything from little pellets up to, you know, gas you can pump into the ground to oh. almost a version of atomic bomb for gophers. <laughs> so just a question. And uh, this repels all. This is a good product that comes in uh, liquid and pellets. And uh, I have, the way I've used some is 
I recently, it was last summer, I think, I found that one plant was being eaten, maybe by a bunny, I don't know who it was, it didn't really matter. <laughs> and I had the pellets, pellet version of this, and I just sprinkled it around, around the plant to create this barrier, and then I watered it. And what happens with the pellets is that uh, they, uh, they get wet, they have a smell that I don't think humans can notice, but deer, javelina, rabbits, they don't really like it, it's kind of strong, and the, the texture, once it gets wet, it's sort of tacky and sticky, so they don't like it. Um, and so there's a liquid version as well, and we have other sprays you can spray on plants. So that's a whole other approach. If, so you know, if you have these sage plants and they're being left alone, it's possible that the nice roses are not, or some other low flowering plant is not being left alone by pests. And so we have down in the store a whole whole selection of different things. A lot of times folks will start out and okay, let's start out with something easy, see if that works, and then move up to something a little bit stricter. The same can be said about different fungicide sprays. When we were talking about the photinias. If you have photinias, they can get um, powdery mildew on them. And a lot of times just spraying with this copper fungicide will take care of it. Now, this, uh, we were talking about uh, having multiple plants, and I think I've got about 11 of them. And this is, the, you know, my wrist would wear out before I could spray the whole plant. And so I moved it up to another level where there is a, um, a uh, systemic liquid that I can put into a spray or a hose sprayer, and they just spray them all. So some plants, you know that maybe they're going to get, they're going to get something talking about the Plotinias, you probably are familiar with them, but some of them over there. Those are wonderful plants that can create a barrier. You know, if your neighbor's propane tank is on the other side of those, you're less likely to see them if you grow those. <laughs> I've got uh, three of them, and they're hiding the air conditioning compressors on the side of my house. Don't even know that they're there anymore. Every now and then they get a little something. I'm familiar with it because it's happened, so I spray them. So, that's part of uh, what we try and provide to people. They'll come in and say, what's happening? Or the thing I like is people will call on the phone and say, my pine tree doesn't look good, what do I do? Well, we need a little, a little more specifics. People will bring in photos, they'll bring in cuttings. We have this new gadget, which I think is wonderful. It's our microscope, and it, it projects onto a computer screen. It's a, it's a huge enlargement. So you can see that, okay, yeah, there, are, there are maybe some thrips here that you might not normally see, and you, it helps us to diagnose. Not that we can figure out every problem, but a lot of times, you know, people come in with a little bitty cutting, put it up there, and you wouldn't really see it with the naked eye, but that helps, it's a great tool. So let's talk a little bit more. Okay, yeah, so if you have roses, if you have other plants that are susceptible to crypt mites, whatever it might be. Um, this multi-purpose insect control is an, another good product to use. And this is also something that you mix in with a sprayer. We can use either a pump sprayer or a handheld hose connected, and it kills over 100 insects and pests. So sometimes it's not really so critical to know exactly what it is if there are 100 of them that are being treated. You know, although if you really have to know, that microscope can be helpful as well. And keep an eye on your roses. Um, I've already seen aphids out there, so be aware. Check your gardens. The bugs are out, so keep checking. Um, Multi-purpose is a great product to get rid of all those aphids. Um, water self-purpose fertilizer is what we call the meat and potatoes. Um, of the fertilizers. Um, it's applied every three months, March, July, uh, October, and, and Christmas or uh, January or New Year's um, if uh, you have evergreens. Um, but this is our meat and potatoes everyday use fertilizer for everything. Um, you can use it in your gardens, with your shrubs, your trees, um, vegetables, everything. Um, this flower power is a uh, water soluble, which means you just mix it up in a water can. Um, has a super high middle number, which is your phosphates, 
Um, it's all for flowers and for root, your root system. So to keep your hand baskets beautiful all, all summer long, every two weeks, put some on, and it'll keep them blooming all summer long. Um, your tomatoes, your peppers, if you water with this, um, it'll keep that flower production going. Um, really good stuff for anything that flowers. And the thing that's nice about that flower power is that it's really easy to use. There's a little scoop in here. And so I took take two scoops, put it in a two-gallon watering can. And I figure I'm going to be watering, say, the dead plants anyway. So you just scoop that in, put it in, and you can just be part of your regular watering. You know, this week you just, just do water, following week, and then every two weeks, hence, you use the flower power. And it's not, it's not an extra chore. You don't have to mix it up. Don't worry about the dimensions, I mean, the mix or anything. It's just two scoops, a little scooper in there. Well, they're soluble, so it works. It works really well. It does make a big difference in, in the flowers that you get. You know, those plants that maybe you've got out on the front porch, the back deck, where it might be in a few weeks, they're going to be flowering and doing well. You just want to keep that bloom going um, strong. Um, just something that we always talk about um, here is when you're planting, you want to plant um, or dig your hole three times as wide as the pot that it's in and just as deep, just as high as it's sitting in the pot itself. Um, two thirds natural soil to one third mulch. Um, that gives you some organic matter. You don't want that hole too rich or your tree's just not going to get out where it needs to be. Um, it has to get used to our nasty soils. I mean, it, it, it's just what it is. Um, the root and grow, which is right here, is a great product. It's, it's a root stimulator. Um, it stimulates those fine hair roots, so it gives you good root production. Um, use it the first three times, or uh, like every two weeks for the first three, six weeks, I guess. Um, and you, you're, you're going to have a strong, healthy tree or shrub. Many of you may have uh, mature trees, especially evergreens on your property, and they are susceptible to uh, bark beetles and other infestations. The best way to keep the tree from getting that sort of thing, any kind of infestation, is to keep it healthy, make sure it's fertilized and watered. Bark beetles and pests in general attack trees that are weak, that are not doing well. We do have a product that's called Plant Protector, and it addresses it, it addresses all these bark beetles and, and Scale. scales and a bunch of things that that people will wonder what's happening with my pine tree. You know, the leaves, needles are yellow. The, the thing that's nice about this is it's you just mix it with water, pour it in around the trunk, and you only have to do it once a year. And it's a product that gets into the roots and then kills those bark beetles that are in the tree. So that's something you know when you uh, if you have something that's already growing, doing well, and you obviously want to keep it that way, you want to make sure that you can keep track of it, make sure it's not getting any diseases, because one of the things we talked about earlier this week is the value, the value of landscaping to your home value, and that the return on investment, you know, you get more than you put in to um, landscaping. In terms of dollars, there have been some surveys. So, you know, you have, you do a kitchen remodel and you get whatever, 80, 90, yeah, 75 percent value back. You put in a swimming pool and you get negative, you're already in holes since you put the swimming pool. You put trees in, you, you may get 110 percent back. And so, this is a big thing. I, I, in my yard, you know, I look at trees that are 10 years old and Okay, I really want to keep these going because someday when I sell this house, I want people to walk in there and say, look at that unblazed maple. It's so beautiful. And you know how important that is. I talk all about that curb appeal. It's nice to have a little flower pot on the porch, but it's also nice to have a healthy, mature landscape. And I think with, since you're here, you're gardeners, you're interested in doing that, we're here to help you uh, to continue that process. So it's an ongoing sort of thing. Uh, it's not as though you, know, you just Put the tree or the shrub in the ground and you're done 
and that's it, basically. You know, you have to maintain any of the water. And Michelle's going to talk about water a little bit later. Um, one of the things about this class format is it's pretty informal. So we are um, we're ready to uh, at any time uh, answer questions that you may have. And if you have something that's maybe more specific, we, we can talk afterwards. Um, show you plans. We've got lots of folks here to show you what we have here. Um, you, if you've been here before, you probably know that this nursery, our annuals and vegetables for the most part, those are that way are the evergreens, cypresses, that sort of thing. We mentioned fruit trees over to my left. All along the wall down there are the um, ornamental flowering trees. And some of them are just really in their prime this time of year. And we have you know maples, aspens, red buds, crab apples, locusts, flowering pears. We have a whole selection of here. A lot of people ask about what's a good shade tree. I need a shade tree. I have nothing on my property. The sun beats down in the house. There are some quite a few good shade trees. So feel free to ask questions. And um, Michelle, do you want to talk about watering now or? Um, water is very important um, standard here. Um, with our winds, um, between now and the monsoons, winds are going to blow. It, it's the driest time for us here. Um, you don't have to water as often as you think you do here. Um, most established, you know, two or three year old trees, once a week, if you water sufficiently, is all that a tree or shrub is going to need. Your smaller stuff, maybe two or three times a week. Um, maybe in June, if we have another June like we did last year, um, you might have to bump that tree watering to twice a week. Um, a lot of it's common sense. Um, most people actually kill their plants with kindness, opposed to neglect. Um, they tend to water. Oh, I just thought I'd water every day just to make sure it gets enough. Um, if you water every day, plants need to dry out. They actually need oxygen to help them survive. If they don't get oxygen, they drown, they rot, and, and it'll, you'll, you'll end up killing your tree or shrub. Um, so it just kind of depends. We do have planting guides down at the store. Um, we can send one to you if you pass this up. Um, this is just an email address. We have some handouts that we're going to send you um, that has that's involved in this class. So I'm just going to give it to you. Um, this is the next class that we're doing. So um, you can take one and pass it down. Okay. So one other thing about soil amendments. This is gypsum. Uh, some of you may have soils in your yard that are pretty clay heavy clay. Gypsum can help break that down. But the main thing that I wanted to stress about, about soil is that you know all soils are on the pH scale from acid to alkaline. And right in the middle is where most plants are happy. And most of our soils here are way high on the alkaline side. And so soil sulfur is good some a product that you can add, especially if you have acid loving plants such as Azaleas, rhododendrons, hydrangeas, camellias, blueberries. I planted a blueberry, but I put it in a big pot because I didn't feel like struggling with having an acid loving plant in a high alkaline soil. So I'm still going to add the phosphorus to the blueberries, but I'm hoping that the, uh, the soil, the potting soil, our potting soil that I used here, will be a little more neutral. But uh, phosphorus and trying to raise the level. Or lower the pH level so it gets closer to 6.0, which I think is neutral, is always something that you can do and is, it is helpful, uh, helpful to the soil. And we have a bunch of products down below that can, that can help you with that. But uh, just be aware when if you're going to pick out hydrangea, and they are beautiful plants, that what they need, like a lot of the acid loving plants, they need shade and they need. Acid oil, the acid soil, not alcohol. Just one more thing with the, the gypsum. Um, if you've ever had tomatoes and you get that black spot that's on the bottom, that just all you see is the black, um, just 
just at the, at the very bottom, it's plas uh, plasma and rot is what it's called, um, which is the lack of calcium in, in the soil. Uh, so there's a couple of things that you can do. Um, the uh, tomato scent um, spray helps the flowers, um, creates better flowers and allows them to hold on longer. Um, the blossom end rot spray, which I didn't pick up, um, is right over there. Um, it's actually cal a spray calcium that you can spray on the flowers so it gives that. The uh, gypsum actually has 20% calcium in it. So if you mix this in with your raised bed, your container, this will help give your tomatoes the calcium it needs to be strong and healthy without the blossom end rot. Anybody have any questions? sulfur to keep the Colorado blue spruce blue and and yeah you definitely want to um, there is sulfur in our fertilizer the 744 um, we do also sell extra sulfur it, um, that you can add um, in the spring and in the fall um, that'll keep your colors bright and beautiful um, it also works on maples as well if you hit that you know, in September, right before um, they, they start turning, you'll get brighter colors. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Uh, with regard to fruit trees, which one does the best? The apple around here, which the hardiest? They all do well here. Um, and if, with apples, well, all the fruit trees, it's just a matter of taste. Um, even the peaches and stuff uh, do well. Um, you just don't get fruit all the time. Your tree's just going to be fine. So it's just the fruit part that isn't. So that my question was about which fruit tree is the hardiest, and that can vary from one yard to the next. But I've found just from talking to folks who come back in here to get other fruit trees. And they share their experience. They say that the cherries and the apples seem to be uh, the hardiest, uh, and then just kind of the right conditions around here. Uh, those are, you know, they by no means there. They produce better. They produce better, yeah. And uh, if they're the, as Michelle mentioned, that they can get them the, the later the blossom, the better chance you're going to have that'll survive the cold, and you'll have, you know, a good fruit, you know, a good crop that summer. The other thing about fruit trees is this came up a lot last summer. The, fruit, the trees were just so full of fruit that they really needed to be thin. Um, and if you have a branch that has, say, four or five apples on it, you could thin that down to one or two, and it's probably a good thing. And you can do that when they're smaller, maybe just pick off the little ones. It's really important that you get a better fruit. It's going to be easier on the tree just because carrying so much weight it's not always good for the tree. A friend of mine had a 20-foot, 20 20-year-old 20 apple tree, and it was just so full of fruit, he couldn't reach it. And one day, it just cracked, just fell over, that was it, it was done. And he had to get the tree service to come, and they just, you know, ground up branches and had bags and bags of apples. So that's, you know, an unfortunate end to a tree, but it can happen. And so to prevent that sort of accident and to encourage better fruit development, uh, thinning is really important. You want to talk about our trees? Sure. So we will talk a little bit about the plants we have here. And this is a uh, fig tree. And Michelle, you were telling me a little bit about this this morning. Why don't you go ahead? Yeah, um, this is a Cadota fig tree. Um, it's hardy from zone 7 to 11. Um, so it's hardy here. Um, so. Um, really nice specimen. We just got some in. Um, we actually got five trucks in this week. Um, so if we don't have them, check back because um, things are coming in weekly. Um, really cool if you like figs. Um, most of the fig trees that I've seen are on eights or nines, so this is really cool to have seven. We have 
have some nice Japanese maples over here, the uh, green and burgundy, and they get to be maybe 15 to 20 feet tall. So they're not the little babies, but they do need some shade. And they don't especially like <coughs> howling wind. Sometimes people will grow them in containers on the front porch and maybe eventually move them into the ground. But they're very distinctive, attractive trees. What else? Uh, we talked about the Adelina yeah. proof. <laughs> um, we talked about, did we talk about the autumn sage? Yeah. Okay. Beautiful annual Bogomelia. We're not on the desert over here. Um, this is a Diane, right? Yeah. Uh, Maiden Pink, which is the family of the carnation. Um, fairly rabbit proof. However, this winter they did go after mine. I think they were pretty desperate. Um, blooms all summer long. Um, they look gorgeous right now. Do you have to get it? Yeah, if you deadhead them, you keep getting those blooms going all year round. Um, this is a um, delphinium. Thank you. <laughs> My mind is went blank. Um, gorgeous shape. More, it can tolerate some morning sun, um, but it doesn't like that hot afternoon and kind of fry. Um, it's a spring bloomer. Um, if you're going to plant one of these, I would stake it. These guys get some get really heavy and with the winds that we have, um, you're going to lose it. Yeah. As soon as it breaks off down here, the plant's done. So if you're going to buy one of these, definitely stake it so it doesn't blow away. Um, this here is kind of cool. Um, is a gold flame honeysuckle. Um, very pretty flowers, very prominent. Blooms all summer long. Smells wonderful. Um, this is one of the deciduous varieties of honeysuckle, so it is going to lose its leaves. Um, I had some customers yesterday that decided, well, they're going to get some halls, which is the one that's evergreen here, and then just mix one of these in with it, so they get the beautiful flowers and they have the evergreen for the rest of the year. And speaking of halls. <laughs> they have some over there. Some of them are about seven feet tall. Pretty amazing plants. And as Michelle mentioned, the evergreen aspect of it. And that one says it's a Japanese halls and it's mostly evergreen. So if you have a mild winter of the evergreen, I, I don't know if there's a difference between regular halls and Japanese halls, but I can tell you that I have regular halls in my yard and I took a plant about this size and just undid the stakes and just put it on the ground and said, you're going to fill in, just be a mound, you're not going to be on the trellis. Now, six years later, I have a plant that is about like this, it just, and it has its leaves all winter long when not a whole lot else is going on in the yard. Now it's getting ready for those beautiful yellow and white flowers and the only problem it ever has is sometimes like in the last summer's heat wave it wilted a little bit so big deal i just gave it a little extra water mm -hmm. but some folks would say look i gotta have this i gotta have this trellis here i gotta have this privacy um, and what's important to them is to have something that's evergreen and usually with the halls you can accomplish that not necessarily all the vines some of these they're not evergreen but they may have flowers that you find more appealing than the halls it's kind of a Kind of trade -offs. Yeah. 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 Okay. So the question is about if you take um, a honeysuckle and put it on the ground, will, will it grow uh, like a, a ground cover? And the answer is yes. I think I would grow it a little bit higher on the bank and have it come down. That's the pattern that mine plant that I put in was in a large area, so I don't care if it just spills out, fills out. That was the purpose of planting it. I find that it's growing more a little bit on the downhill side than the uphill side, but it can certainly fill in the bank very nicely and, and be a, a nice ground cover that, uh, you know, you don't have to really do much of anything. Well, how much sun does it need? My question was, how much sun does this need? Uh, this is a, a definite full sun plant. Aren't they kind of invasive yeah. in the area? Like uh, uh, morning glory? I, 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 I guess we 
question was about whether this is an invasive plant or not. That's your question. It's a honeysuckle, right? Yes. Okay, because I had one in California, and I, they're, they're on like they're, the they're end of my bushes. I never planted them, but uh, the birds evidently have brought parts of it over. <coughs> I haven't. Uh, so the the comment is about whether honeysuckle is invasive. Invasive. This lady's experience in California was that it was, and I wonder if maybe it's less so here, just because. Our conditions. Yeah, I mean, you know, a lot of us have grown things in California. We bring them here. They may do well, but they may grow differently. My honeysuckle I would not consider invasive. It's filled in slowly, but you don't see shoots coming up over here like the Russian saints. So. I, I don't think that's a problem with honeysuckle uh, in general. I mean, it's certainly going to have a lot of growth. If you look at that pulse over there, it's already has these branches going out like this, like saying, put me on the trellis, I'm ready to go. And I think that's the, I mean, we like vigorous growing plants, and if you want that privacy, you know, you don't feel like waiting for five years. You want it to be there now, if possible. And they're, they got these bamboo stakes here, so you can, Easily transfer it to a wall, trellis, whatever, whatever it might be. Do plants like this attract more bees than others? Well, the question was, uh, does it attract bees? Um, yeah, unfortunately, anything that blooms is going to attract bees. Um, so I, what I would recommend is you don't want to put it, you know, in front of your front door, your back patio. Um, if you put it in, you know, along the back fence or something like that, I think you'll do just fine. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Uh, I mean, during the lecture, what flower is the... Hummingbirds love the autumn sage. Um, they, they were, when we, two months ago, when we were just getting stuff in, we had a lot of the autumn sages up here. We had five or six of them in here because they love this flower. Um, if you plant one of these, you will have hummingbirds all year round. Um, anything that's got a like a, a trumpet tube, tubular, um, they love. Um, so this is a great one for, for hummingbirds. And the deer and javelina and rabbits don't love it. As we talked about, because of the herbal smell and taste, they just tend to stay away from them, so you can get the nice hummingbirds in here, but you don't have to worry about these being eaten. You come out in the morning and there's nothing left. Full sun for that one. Full sun. Full sun for the Russian sage. I'm sorry, autumn sage. If you had Russian sage, it would be the same thing, but this autumn sage is full sun, and the one that I have in the corner of my yard, it just it flowers all, all summer. It may have a, you know, a big bloom and then sort of a quiet period, Sometimes I'll give it you know, a little bit of flower power to get it going again. And it keeps going, so it'll it'd be flowering until late in the fall. How it's large pretty, does it get? It gets to be about to be about three feet wide and maybe two feet tall. Um, but it's not in, again it's not invasive and folks wonder about that and that's always a good question. In that spot, I had a Russian sage that the landscaper in his wisdom decided to plant there. And it got to be so big that my neighbors were telling me, because this is a corner, they couldn't see traffic when they were getting ready to make a left turn. So I said, that's no problem, I'll prune it. So I found that I was like pruning it about once a month, you know, and then in the middle of the summer, there were bees all over the place. I said, okay, this is an example of the wrong plant in the wrong place. That can happen. That's why it's important that when you come in here, we talk, and we're willing to, we love talking to people about plants. You look at these, uh, these tags here, especially about Roya tags, they have all kinds of information on the size, the water requirements, the sun requirements. I mean, and so I ended up removing this Russian safe because it was really a traffic hazard. I didn't want somebody blaming me because they had an accident. Planted an autumn stage, and I, every couple of weeks, would go that way and look and say, okay, is that blocking my view or not? Because, you know, I, I mean, I took that really seriously, and it wasn't more than just one person who said they couldn't see because of my Russian sage. Autumn sage has never caused that problem. So when you're wondering about invasive plants, that's a good substitute. It's going to fill in nicely, but it's not going to be invasive. It's not going to send these shoots out. You know, five feet over here, there's a new plant volunteer that you don't even want. And then pretty soon, it gets out of control. That can, that can happen with some plants. 
on that note, um, there's a couple of Russian sages out nowadays that are small dwarf versions. Um, they're not as invasive as the original Russian sage. Um, they get about two feet tall by two feet. So they got the same colors, the same looks, um, but they don't have that invasive big, you know, four, six foot tall growth habit. What's the smallest size of a pot for, that you should put the autumn sage in if you're using it as a potted plant because of the way it expands? So the, the question is the smallest, the question is about what size pot to put if you're going to grow something in a pot, right? Well, the autumn sage. Okay, well in general, I mean, for example, this is a one gallon, this is a one gallon pot. And if you were going to put this in a ceramic clay pot, probably ought to be about twice, twice, twice the size. size, give it some room to grow. And it, it would probably be fine for several years. If you've ever been to uh, I mean, Lisa Lane's classes about container gardening, she'll tell you about how she's had fruit trees in pots for 10 years or more, and they're doing well. You don't want to start them out, you know, just trying to squeeze it into something that's only a little bit larger. Got to give it some room to grow. Uh, so that's kind of a general rule of thumb about twice the size of this uh, or whatever the size might be. And is there a difference between those two plants that is? Well, this one is a two gallon pot. Okay, so just and the Russian, this autumn sage, uh, we have it, uh, about three or four different colors. They're all the same plant essentially. The leaves may look a little bit different. But we've got a solid red, solid pink. This purple is relatively new shade. But they're all going to do the same thing. They're all going to attract common birds and, and be healthy plants that will flower all summer long. So it's hard to be hard to beat that. Thank you. Yes, what month would you begin planting for cold vegetable growing? Okay, so the question is, what month would you begin planting cool vegetable like uh, lettuce, sage, right. uh, char, that sort of thing? And shall we be um, actually, yeah, because we've kind of missed, uh, March is usually the start of cool season vegetables, so we, we add the lettuce, um, kale, uh, Swiss chard, um, there's some sweet peas back there, um, and we still have some of it, um, but the problem with some of that stuff right now is the warmer we get, it's going to start to cold. Mm -hmm. um, so you got to be careful with that. Now come August, you can start thinking about your cool season vegetables again, um, because you're going into that cool season time. So but the, you've got two seasons. Thank you. Yeah. Um, as far as like uh, good native, uh, like low water fruit trees to plant here, what would you recommend? The question was, is, is there a native fruit tree that grows well here that can do some uh, low water? And actually there is the Nankin cherry, um, which is out there. Um, it's a smaller version. Um, it it it's, uh, gets in that 10, I'd say 10 to 15 foot range. Um, beautiful pink flowers uh, in the springtime. Um, it does have fruit, I think it's on the sour more sour side, um, but it does well here, uh, and it, it'll probably take less water than uh, other things. So uh, I think if there aren't any more questions for the group, we'll wrap things up. Feel free to come and speak with us individually, uh, wander around the store, and have to go say hi to the store.